Good afternoon. My name is Peter Sherris, and I am the president of the Rotary Club of Oakland, the third oldest Rotary Club in the world. For over 110 years, we have welcomed the Rotarians and guests from around the world to our club meetings. We continue to do so virtually, and so if you're visiting us, please type your name, and if you're a Rotary member, type in the name of your club into the chat box, and we will recognize you later in the meeting. We begin our meetings by reciting our vision, which is, together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Rotary, Rotary connects connect us all. In the current times, creating change in ourselves is particularly important. And today's, in today's meeting, we're going to focus a bit on that. But first, uh, I want to introduce Jim Caponegro, who is the chair of our Oakland Rotary Endowment. Jim, I understand that you want to call together the annual meeting of the members of the Oakland Rotary Endowment for an important piece of endowment business. Please consider that done. Hey, Jim, how are you? Good, President Peter. How are you today? I am just fine. Thank you very much. Um, on, up? The, on the matter of electing new members of the Board of Trustees for the Oakland Rotary Endowment, I would like to present the following three new members to the ORE board, Kathleen Sims, Christine Watson, and Leanne Alameda. Um, would all in favor of, the, of um, adding these three new members to our uh, ORE board, would you please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> would, any, would any of those who oppose please unmute themselves and say nay? All right, the ayes have it. The new <clears throat> members are officially elected. The annual meeting of the Oakland Rotary Endowment is now adjourned. Back to you, President Peter. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jim. That went uh, pretty smoothly. <laughs> so... Our club recites the Pledge of Allegiance on six patriotic days a year, and, and Flag Day is one of them, and it's coming up this Sunday. I have asked past district governor and past president, Ed Jellum, to lead us in the pledge and to give us the thought of the day. Ed, are you there? I am here, Peter. Thank you, uh, President Peter. Thank you. As most of you know, our board of directors implemented a policy in an effort to accommodate and respect the diversity of opinions that we would recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag six times each year, as President Peter mentioned. When President Peter asked me to lead the pledge on this occasion, I had some mixed feelings in light of the recent killings by police of mm. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and others who certainly did not get liberty and justice. Yet I do see the pledge as something that can be, if not a recitation of facts, but perhaps a recitation of hope. What words then might I say in introducing the pledge today that might make us feel better about reciting or hearing the pledge recited on this occasion and in light of recent history? I thought about that and I looked for such words, but when all is said and done, I didn't have to go too far because just within the last several days, I heard some inspiring words from former President of the United States, Barack Obama, who recently addressed the graduating class of 2020. And now, as our thought for the day, I quote from parts of President Obama's address by way of introducing the Pledge of Allegiance. President Obama said, the thing is, class of 2020, what these past few weeks have shown us is that the challenges we face go well beyond a virus and that the old normal wasn't good enough. It wasn't working. In a lot of ways, the pandemic just brought into focus problems that have been growing for a very long time, whether it's widening economic inequality, the lack of basic health care for millions of people, 
the continuing scourge of bigotry and sexism, or the divisions and dysfunction that plague our political system. Similarly, the protests in response to the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery, and Nina Pop aren't simply a, reflect, a reaction to those particular tragedies, as heartbreaking <clears throat> as they are. They speak to decades worth of anguish and frustration over unequal treatment and a failure to reform police practices and the broader criminal justice system. It's not always pretty, this democracy of ours, trust me, I know. It can be loud and messy and sometimes depressing. But because citizens took seriously the mandate that this is a government of and by and for the people, bit by bit, <clears throat> excuse me, generation by generation, we've made progress from cleaning up our air and water to creating programs that lifted millions of seniors out of poverty to winning the right to vote and to marry who you love. None of these changes happened overnight or without sustained effort, but they did happen, usually because young people marched and organized and voted and formed alliances and just led good lives and looked out for their families and their communities and their neighborhoods and slowly changed hearts and minds. America changed and has always changed because young people dared to hope. Democracy isn't about relying on some charismatic leader to make changes from on, on high. It's about finding hope in ourselves and creating it in others, especially in a time like this. You don't always need hope when everything's going fine. It's when things seem darkest, that's when you need it the most. As someone said, hope is not a lottery ticket. It's a hammer for us to use in a national emergency to break the glass, sound the alarm, and sprint into action. That's what hope is. It's not the blind faith that things will get better. It's the conviction that with effort and perseverance and courage and a concern for others, things can get better. That remains the truest part of our American history. And with those words, I invite those of you who wish to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to do so. I'm going to remain seated so that if my picture is on and my hand uh, is on my heart, I remain seated with no disrespect to our flag. Here goes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible. with, and I hope I believe there will be, and hope there will be, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Rotarians and President Peter. Thank you so much, Ed. These last couple of weeks have been a very tough time, a lot of soul searching. Uh, and clearly, as uh, President Obama said, uh, our society really needs to have, have profound change. And one of those changes happens to be right in our uh, vision that I read earlier in today. And that is, is that we need to create change in ourselves. Uh, maybe it's even the most important part of our vision. With this in mind, the executive team our board of uh, directors, uh, some nearby Rotary clubs and members feel that our club needs to publicly make an explicit statement against systemic racism and inequity. This action will align us with many for-profit and non-profit organizations which have done so. We've agreed on wording, which I now want to present to the club for members' input. After presenting it, I'm gonna break the club up into small groups um, to discuss it. Pat Williams has put into chat a link to the document. Just click it and it'll open in your browser. You'll be able to read it for yourself. The topic I'd like groups to discuss is how our club can alter and should alter its philanthropic efforts to better address systemic racism and inequity. And here's the statement. There is no room for racism in our communities. And the very concept of such is against everything that Rotary Clubs and members of Rotary stand for and believe. Promoting respect, celebrating diversity, demanding ethical leadership, and working to advance peace and conflict resolution are central tenets of our work. We recognize that focusing on and promoting the community-based projects as we've been doing for generations is no longer sufficient. In addition, we need to work to eliminate policies, actions, and unjust practices 
that promote privilege or subjugate the rights of any human being. Rotary's vision is to bring people together and create lasting change in our communities and in ourselves. We will unite around this vision and stand with those who are working for peace, justice, and equality for all members of our society. Black lives matter. And we believe that reform and change are necessary so that one day we can live in a society truly beneficial to all. We will continue to work to create a more just, open, and welcoming society for all people. So now my plan is to randomly assign, there are 56 people on the, on the, on the uh, Zoom meeting. I'm gonna assign you to breakout rooms of about six or eight people. So please uh, uh, plan on discussing this statement and the things that our club needs to do to, uh, to improve the situation. We'll, we'll rejoin the main session at 12.55, and uh, you'll have 60 seconds warning before the breakout sessions end. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up those breakout sessions now. I think probably 10 rooms is about right. And here we go. Okay, we have uh, 59 people back, so welcome back. I hope that you found a chance to talk uh, in a small group, uh, enjoyable and productive and uh, meaningful, and I hope uh, you learned something. Uh, for those who would like to discuss this issue further, we're, we're going to keep the meeting going privately after 1.30 p.m. We'll shut down our live stream, we'll shut down our video recording, and allow members or, or people who are in those groups to uh, speak their minds. And I think it'll be useful for me and also other members of the executive team. Now I'd like to reintroduce Ed Jelen to let us know if we had any visitors. Uh, Ed, are you still with us? I am still here, Peter. Uh, I'm not sure where I am, let's see. Oh, there I am. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am disappointed for the very first time to have to report that I did not see any chat room people who joined us uh, as visiting Rotarians or visitors. So if I miss somebody, I apologize, but uh, I didn't see any. So uh, maybe next week. Thank you, Peter. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. We always enjoy coming to you. So just before we uh, go to the speakers, Actually, let me make sure. Actually, I know what I'm supposed to do now. Jack Isles, yes, I believe Peter. That I'd ask you to say something. Yeah, so we, uh, Shannon O'Hara, she did ring the bell five times. Uh, and we just want to sort of call attention to that. Uh, she rang the bell four times in honor of Iris Brody Lopez. So I, I think Pat's got the bell if she wants to give it a little ding. And then uh, Jack McAvoy is uh, getting a bell ring too from Shannon O'Hare. So four times for Iris, once for Jack, five times in total. Thank you, Shannon O'Hare, so much. Yay. Shannon, that is, that's an unbelievable, wonderful donation. And for those uh, that might not know, a single bell ring is a $100 donation to the Oakland Rotary Endowment. So Shanna, thank you very much. She couldn't join us today, I just checked, but uh, anyway, thanks again. So um, I'd also like, I have just one other thing, and that is that uh, I'd like to make one more appeal for members and friends of the Rotary Club of Oakland to like our webpage. I set a goal to go from around 300 uh, likes on our page to 1,000, and we're almost there. I looked at it this morning, we are at 962 people who like our page, who see our posts. And so if I can, so please, if just 10 of you can get a few of your friends and relatives who are on Facebook 
to go to the club page. All you have to do is go to Facebook, put in Rotary Club of Oakland, uh, and then click that main first like, which I've indicated there. You'll really help me achieve this goal, and, and you'll also help improve the visibility of the club. And then also, those who like Facebook, if you see something that we post, a project that we do that you really like, share it. Share it with all your friends. That also helps drive our uh, engagement and uh, really drives our publicity. So... 12.58, Sonia Fitz, are you there? I'm here, am I unmuted? Hey Sonia, no you're not, you're live and going good, so please introduce today's speaker. Okay, um, so I'm here to introduce Joshua Simon. My first memory of Joshua, and I'm not sure if he remembers this, is when he and my former boss, Buna Chima, who is also a powerhouse on housing issues, came to my tiny studio apartment when I was still in college and had just started where I still work at Boss to bring me a little Mac Plus computer so I could work on a grant proposal without having to continually retype pages from scratch. So besides being an early adopter of technology, Joshua is also a visionary when it comes to housing and built spaces, having devoted his career at Ibaldsi and other development organizations to creating not just affordable housing, but, uh, uh, but developments that become the heartbeat of the neighborhood and create opportunities to engage with neighbors. Places like Swan's Market in Oakland and housing programs throughout the East Bay that have on-site gardens, computer labs, outdoor playgrounds, childcare centers, and produce markets. These are the kinds of housing programs that lift up not just the people that live there, but everyone in the neighborhood and everyone in the city. So I'm excited to hear what's new in his world. Please welcome Joshua Simon. Thank you very much, Sonia. I actually do remember that. <laughs> um, so I've, I've now, uh, I, I came to Abaltsy about 27 years ago um, and uh, I've now been the executive director for the last uh, seven years, but um, uh, Abaltsy really grew out uh, of a time very much like today, uh, a time of uh, protest and community frustration when the uh, freeways in Oakland's Chinatown were being carved through existing neighborhoods and BART was being uh, carved as a large trench right th through the middle of Chinatown uh, Laney College was displacing uh, a large part of the community, uh, as was the BART station and redevelopment around it. Uh, and out of that tumult and frustration in the community, community members and some UC students came together uh, to create uh, East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, Ibaltsi. Um, and if I can have the uh, first uh, slide, please. Um, and, uh, and we'll just go directly to the uh, second slide. Um, so out of that work, a group of uh, students and community members uh, patterned on the work of the Unity Council uh, came together and created the Asian Resource Center as a place where the community, which at that point uh, felt like it, we were being torn apart, uh, could come together under one roof. But very quickly, we realized that housing was also a problem. And uh, so Baltsy began to, um, to build affordable housing as well as community facilities and places for nonprofit organizations. Uh, and uh, when you build one building a year for 45 years, uh, they add up. Um, and um, so Abaltsi uh, now has uh, a portfolio of housing that now totals about 2% um, uh, of the rental housing in Oakland. Um, uh, next slide. Um, after a number of years and, and after building housing in not only Oakland, but uh, Emeryville and uh, Richmond and the city of San Pablo, uh, we began to take a step back and say, well, we've done a lot of housing and we've done work with space for small business and space for nonprofits, 
but are we really moving the needle with poverty? Are we really leveling the field so that people facing discrimination, people facing barriers have the same opportunities and have the ability to, to, uh, to, to live better lives and to thrive? And we began looking at the work of the health community and they, in the health community, there's this idea of social determinants of health. And we realized that if we put our residents at the center of what we do and uh, the needs of the neighborhoods that we serve, that there are many different organizations and many different needs. Um, and in this health context of what the health professionals call social determinants of health, they found statistically that it takes not just one thing, but many things, arts and education, food access, transportation, um, uh, business development, that all of these things together uh, are needed uh, to be able to make a healthy neighborhood. And that no, no one thing will lift people out of poverty, but finding a way to coordinate these. Uh, next slide. And we immediately said, well, gee, we can't do everything. Nobody can do everything. So we decided to focus on what we do best. And we decided one of the things that we do best is work in collaboration. So finding ways to build strong neighborhood partnerships with many different organizations so that as long as we're putting the people we serve at the center of what we do, then we're focusing on who are the organizations that serve the same people that we do and how do we all work together for the benefit of those folks and how do we find a way to incorporate the voices of the people we serve into the work that we do. Um, so we focused on building those strong networks on the affordable housing options that we've been working on the community and resident engagement so that those voices can be part of the conversation and income and wealth building opportunities. That those are the four things that we focus on in collaboration with others. Next slide. Uh, and at the same time, we looked at how we do our work. So how do we uh, work for equity and inclusion within our own staff? How do we lead pull leadership development to lead the next, uh, for the next group of leaders coming out of both our staff and our partners? How do we work for equity and inclusion? And how do we organize ourselves uh, around both the four pillars and around community leadership? Uh, next slide. So having said that, um, we, then organized ourselves into the different um, areas that we work. So we work everything from the community uh, space development, like the Asian Resource Center, the first building that we started with, uh, to affordable housing development. Once we develop it, uh, managing it is even more important than what we develop. The building has to look as good and function as well for the residents after 20 years as it does on the day of the ribbon cutting. Um, neighborhood and economic development, how do we um, uh, connect our residents to uh, the resources uh, and neighborhood collaborations? How do we tie all of this into the work of our partners? Next slide. So what does this all look like when we add it all up together? Um, well, the, um, you may have heard in the news about our um, work with the uh, Lake Merritt BART station. Uh, our plans for that BART station are shown here. Uh, we currently have nine different sites under uh, development with about 700 units. Uh, plus, it's very important to us to continue to modernize uh, our buildings. A building is like a car. If you don't rebuild it every 20 years, it begins to melt. Um, and how do we make sure we're providing the services for our residents? Uh, the picture shown uh, shows uh, buildings B and D, which will be buildings that we will develop at the BART station. 
Uh, you may have seen Building E, which is uh, a building we just finished renovating, and it's an example of recapitalizing our buildings. And then we're working with a joint venture partner, Strata Development, on uh, the uh, market rate housing. And uh, we still believe that there will be office space in the future, um, uh, although some question that. Uh, so we're working on community offices to make a healthy neighborhoods hub at the Lake Merritt Bart Station. Next slide. But as we build in the neighborhoods and as we listen to the residents that we serve in the neighborhoods, uh, one of the insights that uh, we've heard from our residents is it's great to build a new building, but we can't build buildings as fast as people are being displaced from Oakland. And even with the economic downturn, we're concerned that people will continue to be displaced from Oakland as jobs are lost and people find that their economic future is just not in the inner Bay area. And we're concerned that in particular, uh, essential workers are going to be priced out of the inner Bay area. Uh, so one of the things we've begun to do is to try to buy the buildings that are most at risk. Uh, we often have um, brokers come to us and say, we have buildings with high upside potential. Well, as a community development professional, I hear that. And what that translates to is the low income people who live there now need to be priced out for that high income potential. So how do we lock down the affordability of those buildings? How do we find ways to, um, uh, to be able to um, uh, convert them from um, market rate housing to affordable housing so that we have a reserve of places for, for um, our essential workers in our community? Uh, to do that, we've worked with Kaiser's uh, housing for Health Fund operated by Enterprise and with the partnership for the Bay's Future uh, that uh, many of you, um, your institutions may be investors in. And this has become a way that people can invest. Uh, these are five properties that we just bought. We bought a portfolio of properties because we've decided that buying in bulk wholesale, we can get more done than retail. If any of you uh, know of or own properties that uh, you would like to see uh, become part of um, the resources for uh, uh, people who work in Oakland to be able to live in Oakland, um, we'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, or if you'd like to invest in these kind of funds, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, Part of this is, again, not just providing the housing, but underwriting the project so that we can provide resident services. And we're also talking with groups like Asian Pacific Environmental Network about are there ways for residents to have more control of the housing uh, and even looking at opportunities for residents to have uh, a partial ownership in the prop properties. Um, so we're very excited about uh, that piece of the future. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, an image of uh, the uh, um, affordable senior building that we're planning at the uh, BART station, in the market rate housing next to it, and in between uh, economic development space. Uh, for small businesses and restaurant businesses coming out of Laney College. Um, so again, housing is not the only piece of community development. Having ways to have financial counseling for people, ways to have youth programs and small business space uh, and technical assistance to small business, particularly in the moment we're in. Uh, we have 16 restaurants and food-related businesses, uh, 14 of which are, are owned by um, people of color in the community. Uh, so we're talking about how do we make sure that those folks have the resources to survive the moment we're in? How do we 
for, uh, for resources. And uh, we've recently launched a program working with the town called uh, Good Good Eats to provide those resources. Um, next slide. And finally, going beyond the work that Abolfi does, our partners are very much part of who we are and working in partnership with the community uh, to be able to, um, to do is absolutely critical. Um, uh, we've been able to, um, uh, um, we've been able to uh, work in this case, uh, this is an intersection next to the California Hotel where several, actually two of our residents were trying to the street and were hit by a car. One of them was actually killed. Uh, so we worked with the churches, the residents, the neighbors, uh, uh, and the surrounding community and the city's Department of Transportation to redo the intersection as a celebration of the culture and creativity uh, of the California Hotel and bringing back the California Hotel as a uh, black cultural zone. Um, so uh, um, I'm going to um, uh, divert a little bit from my comments and just take a moment to address a number of the questions that have come up. Uh, and um, in particular, uh, there's the question about the ethnic mix of our properties. Uh, we're about 40% um, uh, Asian, uh, about 40% African American, uh, about 20% uh, uh, mix of white and Latinx. Our Latinx population is actually increasing. Um, and um, uh, the larger we grow, the more that our population uh, reflects uh, the population of uh, Oakland as a whole and our buildings tend to reflect the neighborhoods that they're in, in terms of uh, who, who we serve. Um, in terms of how we're funded, uh, the affordable housing world has a very complicated set of funding sources, but in general, uh, we are funded by a mix of tax credits and tax benefits. We're funded by uh, private uh, bank loans and by um, uh, 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 grants and bond funds. Uh, in general, the lower the incomes we serve, the more subsidy uh, that are required. Uh, so uh, we're trying to uh, do a, a manufactured housing development now that serves homeless. And even though we got the cost of the development down to half of what it usually costs to develop a building in Oakland, uh, we still need grant funds because the rents for people coming out of homelessness are going to be two or three hundred dollars a month, and it costs a thousand dollars a month to operate the building um, after you pay insurance and and operating costs and services and everything else. Um, so finding ways to subsidize that kind of work for um, uh, for particularly for homeless families has been difficult. We've been trying to address that. We try to have mixed income buildings. We'd like our buildings to be diverse, mixed income communities. Um, so that's um, one piece of our work. Um, there's a comment about the uh, Yemeni community uh, in the Havens Court, and which is a very insightful comment. And yes, we have a very large Yemeni community in, um, in our Havens Court development, where we own Lion Creek Crossings, uh, which is 570 apartments uh, next to the Coliseum. Uh, so whenever you're at the Col Coliseum, uh, five of the six uh, new buildings that you'll see next to the Coliseum BART station are, uh, is that pro project. The key to that project has actually been the Family Resource Center, which brings together uh, the different families uh, to build understanding between the different uh, ethnic communities uh, in our buildings. Um, the, um, there's a question about how we select residents. So in general, uh, we use a lottery system. 
Uh, for many years, we had waiting lists at each building. And it's, uh, we found that it wasn't very fair because somebody could be on a waiting list for 10 years. And so rather than, and, and we were spending a ton of staff time looking for people who had been on the waiting list for years who had already moved on. So instead we open up a marketing list once every year uh, that uh, gives everybody who applies uh, a chance to be at the top of the list every year. Um, on rare occasions, there are buildings that uh, we go through all of the waiting list criteria for that building. Uh, we have a computer algorithm who, that determines, you know, if people meet the different criteria. And um, so on rare occasions, we do advertise um, uh, on Craigslist and other places. And we all also always advertise on our um, website as well. Um, but in general, we, we use the, uh, um, the, way, the uh, marketing list approach. Um, the, um, uh, at, at the end of the day, when you add all of this up, um, uh, what we end up doing is looking at weaving together many different resources. Uh, and we've been trying to do this now for 45 years. Uh, we will be celebrating our 45th anniversary on uh, September 10th. Uh, you're welcome to join us for that uh, celebration. And at that time, uh, I will actually be um, celebrating some news. So uh, you are the first to hear uh, this news. Uh, um, well, the first, maybe not the first to hear that I will be stepping down as executive director on uh, September, uh, I'm sorry, on uh, uh, October 30th, um, and uh, making room for the next generation of leadership at Abaltsy after um, working there for 19 out of the last uh, 26 years. And um, uh, I, uh, I will be going to work for the Community Arts Stabilization Trust, or CAST, uh, which weaves together um, housing, uh, culture, and creativity and small business uh, into um, housing and community facilities. Uh, and so I hope to be working with Abaltsy in the future in my new position and um, am uh, glad to, um, to answer further questions. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, and congratulations on all those years and congratulations on making it to the point where you can actually uh, move on and retire. Uh, there was one question from Fred Morse, pretty general question, but uh, his question was, who or what is the biggest impediment to the development of housing? Oh, that's, um, that's a big question. That's a big question. So um, I, I would say there is debate about this in the field. In my opinion, the biggest impediment is, uh, is um, capitalization, is funding. Uh, and, and it's not debt capital. We have more debt capital than we know what to do with. If we had money to repay debt, we could, we could build thousands of units a year. Uh, the problem is equity capital uh, and funding. Uh, since we have low rents, uh, we don't have return on equity, uh, which makes it difficult. So having access to the bond capital, the tax credits and other funds, that's the primary uh, problem. Um, up until the last few months, I would also say construction costs were a problem. But with manufactured housing, we figured out how to reduce the cost and we're still finding that we have a gap, um, mainly because we're trying to serve lower income people and homeless people. So um, I do think uh, there are a lot of efforts to solve this problem. We're working with Facebook and Google and um, Apple and others to find ways to bring in new forms of capital. But most of that is debt and debt um, if you have low, if the rents are equal to your operating costs, there's nothing left over to repay debt. Uh, and that's the biggest problem. Um, Another question uh, comes from Amani. 
How are you handling SB 721 deck inspections for these apartments? S That's the law, I guess, related to the Berkeley deck collapse. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that. Okay, no problem. Um, let's see, uh, and, and I, I don't see any other questions unless someone has a burning question, in which case you can unmute yourself and ask the question. I'll give you one more minute. So thank you, Josh, for talking to us today. I love that uh, Swan's Market down there. I often have people coming to visit me from, uh, from other places and I always, uh, when they when they want to have lunch, I always take them to Swan's Market because it's such a vibrant community. They have the farmer's market right outside. It's really an exciting place. So congratulations on that. Thank you. It's really an honor to speak before the Rotary. I've been a big fan of Rotary for years and hopefully in my new position, I'll, I'll have time to come to, to more meetings. And, and I'm hoping cool. the Lake Merritt BART station will be a new will be a new uh, Swan's Market for the future. Well, we'd love to have you. And uh, we've got a few members who might actually want to recruit you to become a member of the club. So uh, I'll, I'll leave that to them. So one of, the, one of the goals we have had over the last 30 years is to eradicate polio from the face of the earth. Polio is a disease we can eradicate. It will only be the second disease in the world that has been eradicated. And we have been working at that for 30 years and we are this close to accomplishing that goal. And uh, in your honor, we are gonna make a donation to the End Polio Now Fund so that you can contribute to that eradication as well. And so thank you again for your presentation and um, uh, we hope to see you at another meeting of the Rotary Club of Oakland soon. Okay, thank you very much. Jack Isles, I understand you have some more things to tell us. Yeah, so we had another bell ringer, and that was Jason. And Jason wanted to ring the bell in honor of Iris as well. So Jason, thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. That makes us uh, six bell rings today. Can I ring the bell? And there's one more. Oh, Joycey. Hi. Hey, Joycey. I'm new to this computer thing, but I just wanted to ring the bell for my son who had the COVID. He was so very sick and he's doing so very well. And so I just wanted to ring the bell for that. Oh, yay, Joycey. Yeah, we're so glad to so hear glad. that. And you look like an old pro on Zoom. So don't, I'm don't look. always. You, do, you really look like a great I have a, brand, a great I, I have a brand new computer right now, so I'm just trying to figure it all out, but, uh, All right, well, you know. you've got it down pat. <laughs> also, uh, there is one more uh, bell ring, I believe. Two more from... questions, Peter. Oh, go for it. We've got one from Fred, um, and then we have one from Tom, and Tom is ringing the bell also in honor of Iris, and then Fred is ringing the bell for our speaker. Yes, and I think I saw one from Linda Bossenecker, but maybe not. I can't, I can't scan through the uh, chat so fast. But listen, thank you so much for all of those that have rung the bell. I'm so happy to hear from Joycey, because I knew that there was, she was a very sick guy. And so that's great news. And uh, Joe Baralka, Joe Baralka, you are going to introduce next week's speaker, who we are excited about. Hey, Peter. I Oakland Rotarians and guests. So are we really close to eradicating polio? Do you wonder how close this close is? Curious what Rotary is doing about COVID-19? Want to know if Rotary leadership hears our current concerns like diversity and racial equity? Well, next week, the first woman chair and current trustee of the Rotary Foundation, Brenda Cressy will be with us. Brenda will pull back the curtain, take us past closed doors to give us a rare 
behind the scenes view of Rotary in action today. Brenda, Brenda is a Rotary power player, a dynamic, much sought after speaker. Be here next week as we are this close. Gonna be a great speaker, don't miss it. Thank you, Joe. Brenda is indeed a great speaker and it's very exciting to see a woman of the very highest echelons of Rotary leadership. It's been too long as uh, we all know. Thank you all who participated today. Next week, uh, we'll, we'll use this opportunity to focus on our international service. I'm hoping to bring in a couple of uh, people from other countries uh, where, where they are able to talk to us directly on Zoom. There's no reason they can't attend our meetings and talk about some of the work we're doing internationally. Um, we're also uh, going to extend this meeting. Uh, I've received a bit of feedback that people enjoyed those sessions, but there are some things that people would like to say. And so we're gonna go ahead and extend this Zoom meeting so those that would like to can get, give private feedback to the membership to, and to us. Um, and so uh, we will close down our live streaming and we will close down our uh, recording so that it will be private. And so stay with us if you want. But until next week, this meeting of the Rotary Club of Oakland is adjourned. <laughs>